Pujis and Naus. Um, I'm very excited to present our first speaker, Mr. Saman Subramanian. He is a writer, a journalist, a music lover, and a quizzer. And his first book, Following Fish, won the um, Shakti First Book Prize. And he's no stranger to Joseph's because he was here in 2019 presenting his book, A Dominant Character, with us. So we're very excited uh, to have Mr. Saman Subramanian with us and have him talk to us on his take on um, the craft of journalism. Nice to have you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Always a pleasure to talk to Joseph's students and faculty. Speaking of which, Arul, are you here? Uh, I think he's pretending to be uh, away. Uh, so how does this work, Shireen? Should I just talk or would you want to kind of tell me uh, what I what you'd like me to start with? What kind of format do you usually follow? So we'd like you to talk a little bit on um, your craft of journalism, especially um, your engagement with the long form. And then from there, um, we'd like you to talk a little bit on your newsletter as well, which you started during the pandemic. Okay. And your engagement with different kinds of readers would be amazing for us to hear as journalism students. Okay. Uh, great. Okay. So I, for those of you, uh, probably many of you who won't know uh, who I am and the kind of work I do, I mostly write magazine pieces. These are four or 5,000 words long. Typically, they take uh, anywhere between three months, sometimes a year, to research and write and fact check and edit and publish. Um, and sometimes they take a very short time, as I will point out with uh, some examples a little later. Um, so what are long form pieces is sort of maybe the first place where we can stop and uh, st stop and think about this genre. Uh, patently, obviously, they're long, uh, but a 5,000 word piece is not simply 10, 500 word pieces stitched together and smooshed together. There's a lot more that's kind of happening or a lot more that we want to happen within the course of a 5,000 word piece. Because if you think about the small articles you typically read on the front pages of your newspaper, these are about 300 or 400 pages, uh, 300 or 400 words long. They deal with something that has just happened. They're kind of quite brief and to the point. They give you all of the information, which is not usually much information because something has just happened. Uh, they don't go longer than 400 words. They typically quote one, maybe two people. And that's the end of it. There's, no, there's nothing greater there. And so if you just take 10 of these and put them together, that does not form a long form piece. So what does form a long form piece? We can think, a lot, think of this along a number of lines, right? One is um, a sense of narrative. What is a sense of narrative mean? One of my editors used to describe it quite nicely as a sense of time passing by which uh, he, he meant that if a reader reads this piece, he or she gets a sense of a, the evolution of something or someone, the ways in which something or someone has changed over the course of the time period that you're depicting in your piece. Now, the time period may be as little as one day. Time period may be as much as you know 20 years if you're charting the the evolution of an industry, for example, or more than that if you're profiling someone. But you need to get a sense of the passage of time. The second thing is to think about it often in terms of being analogous to fiction or to the short story or to the novel, uh, by which I mean, of course, you don't make things up. Long-form journalism is still very factual and reported. But what I mean is, if you think about a lot of the narrative tropes that you find in a short story or a novel, uh, we then try to import those into long-form journals. And the narrative tropes might include uh, characters, for example. Um, people who are not just names and titles. They are not just so-and-so assistant secretary of whatever ministry. They are actually fully fledged, you know, kind of fully fleshed out three-dimensional human beings, you know, who have histories and tendencies and habits, um, they are maybe flawed human beings if you're really kind of going into some depth in their character. So these are characters that we are talking about as we see them in fiction and, uh, and in novels. What else do we mean? We mean scenes. Very often as a long form journalist, I will try to kind of uh, watch something unfold in front of me so that I can describe it to the reader. Uh, 
Uh, ideally, if I'm profiling somebody, I will try to follow them about as they go about their work or whatever their life may consist of. If I'm uh, writing about a particular industry, I will try to go to places to describe what that industry looks like on the ground. Um, even in the worst possible scenario, when I'm only having a Zoom call with somebody, I will try to describe what their background looks like, where they're sitting, what their own habits are as they're talking on Zoom, that kind of thing. So there, there's, a, there's a sense of scene, a sense of visual immediacy that you try to bring to a reader. Uh, there's also a sense of, um, uh, so we have, we have character and we have scene. We sometimes have dialogue. Again, one of, the, one of the things that ideally would happen is if you're writing about somebody, you're writing about uh, a situation in which multiple people are interacting. Your best bet is to fade to the background and just let these two people interact and talk to each other and try to capture that in your piece. Because even more, that kind of thing brings you, brings the reader into the very space that you are inhabiting yourself while you're researching. So all of these things exist, but then I, I would argue sort of the most important or the most intriguing thing about long form journalism and the thing that makes it, you know, sort of more long lasting than the 300, 400 word pieces um, you read in papers on a daily basis is what I, I and some of my editors call this theory of layers. And let me explain to you what these layers are. All long form pieces or all, all of the long form pieces that I try to write at least are I try to structure them along multiple layers of meaning. And at the very top of the layer, the topmost layer is very superficially what the story is about. Um, so let me kind of uh, think about one of the stories that Arul said you may have read uh, before this, uh, this uh, session, which is a long read that I did on masks for the Guardian very early in the pandemic and about the mask trade and the mask uh, business at a time of enormous stress. So if somebody had asked me what this piece was about, I would say it's about masks during the pandemic. Fair enough. That is layer one. It is the most obvious thing that the piece is about. But then all of these pieces simultaneously also live in two and sometimes three layers below that top mostly. And if you look and, and these are usually layers that are broader and deeper in the sense that they are more idea driven rather than description driven or event driven. And then they are also um, more long lasting to the, to the point that you can kind of go back to the mask piece, hopefully even 10 years from now after the pandemic is a distant memory. And you can read that mask piece and whether you relate to those superficial details of the mask demand and supply business in any way, you will still hopefully be able to relate to the two or three layers below. And in the mask piece, you know, uh, as far as I can remember off the top of my head, the, the, the two, three layers were, you know, the layer below that was about um, the demand and supply of most commodities or how the economy of demand and supply fun functions for critical commodities during times of stress or times of crisis, right? Uh, so it's not just masks. A lot of, uh, you know, masks happen to exemplify those trends and patterns as well. But there are many other commodities like that that exhibit the same trends and patterns. And then the third, the deeper layer below that is a kind of reflection on how the world is actually arranged to encourage this kind of warped demand and supply, this kind of these distortions in how commodities flow during times of crisis. The world has always been set up to encourage that. So it should not come as a surprise during a particular event like the pandemic when you know the mask trade grows hugely distorted to the point where you need to hire security guards to go to South Africa and ship yourself a new ship shipment of masks. Um, the, the ways in which global trade has operated for the last 30 years or so, which means essentially hiving off all manufacturing to China so that uh, you can do it at a lower cost. The price of that becomes clear when you come to a commodity like the mask during a time like the pandemic which means that China is essentially the country that is making all this plastic and other or other finished product for you. And so you have to depend on these distortion, these, these distorted lines of trade and supply um, to even supply, to, to even come up with critical commodities during a pandemic. So this the third, what you might call the deeper or the deepest layer of this story is something that will continue to resonate 
well after the pandemic is passed. It will continue to resonate with other commodities at other times of crisis, um, or even outside of times of crisis. And it is a it is kind of what you might call a reflection on the way in which the global economy is. Now, what long form pieces do really well, or what they should try to do as well as possible, is to use the topmost layer to teach people in a very kind of narrative and engaging way about the second and third layer, so that they come away having not just learned something about why they are not being able to find masks at their local shop, but they also learn something more fundamental about how demand and supply works. Um, to give you another example, um, I wrote again during the pandemic, a piece about uh, the airline business at a time when all these planes were grounded. Uh, and you know, again, on the surface of it, there's a lot of stuff there that is happening that is absolutely fascinating. There are these places called boneyards where airlines and aviation companies send planes to be stacked nose to tail along these long stretches. They're called boneyards because when you look at them from the sky, they just look like a number of skeletons that have just been arranged. Um, what you need to do when a plane is on the ground for more than two or three months at a stretch, the kinds of um, techniques aviation engineers use to make sure that they continue to be flight worthy. So all of this stuff, this detail is extremely engrossing for its own sake. And there are interesting people doing this kind of work and they're done in interesting places, all behind closed doors, the kind of stuff you don't otherwise see, you know, um, not only in a pandemic, but sometimes even outside. But then there, again, you start to think about what the deeper and broader idea driven layers could be. Um, is, one, uh, is one layer about how the aviation industry itself has evolved over the past 50 years. We're all used to uh, an airline business in which we get tickets that seem dirt cheap sometimes, how does the industry sustain that? How did the low cost airline come about? And it turns out that a lot of the difficulties that the airline industry faces today is because of all these bad habits that have been inherited over the last 30 or 40 years uh, of the aviation industry's evolution. And then you go one level deeper and you kind of think about um, uh, aviation itself and its challenges in the near future as people think about sustainability. Uh, nobody was flying during the pandemic, during the lockdowns, and suddenly that was the most sustainable, environmentally friendly aviation industry that had existed for years because nobody was flying. So this dilemma of whether should we be flying, should we not be flying, how does the aviation industry cope with or become more sustainable uh, in the near future, all of these questions can, will continue to resonate even after the pandemic. So my idea when I set out to pitch one of these pieces um, or to start writing about them is always kind of uh, goes along these lines that I've just described. One is to try to find some characters because that topmost layer, I think, is almost always all about people. I mean, if you're not reading about people, it becomes very dull. Uh, the second is to try to find places to go to, uh, scenes that I can describe. Uh, during the lockdown, that wasn't possible, uh, which made reporting extremely dull and boring. Um, and then the third is to kind of find the ideas, the deeper ideas that will continue to animate the piece even after its immediate relevance has passed. And so once I do all of this, you know, then the, uh, the joy of it, you know, the, the most enjoyable part of all of this is definitely the part where I go out and find things out. You know, I, I go to places I, I would never go to otherwise. I see things and meet people and talk, get to talk to them about their work or about what they're passionate about. Uh, and I just get to sit and listen and take notes. Um, it, it can be a difficult job, but you know, I'm not gonna sort of uh, undersell it. It's also, if you can do it, it's in, enormously fascinating, the kinds of places you go to. I've been to um, a boxing ring in Hong Kong where I've seen bankers beat each other up for fun. I've been to, a storage cavern under the sea in Singapore where they store oil. I've been to synagogues in Nigeria. Um, I will be meeting Karan Johar in a month. So, you know, all of this stuff, these are all like uh, big highlights, I think, that uh, that come up in, in the course of a career in long-form journalism, uh, if you get to do it the right way. And um, uh, what more can I say? And I, I think the importance of long-form journalism uh, is twofold in this day and age. One is quite obvious, I think, to everybody here, which is that um, in a time when our attention spans are consumed by 
280 character tweets. Uh, and we sometimes stop thinking in terms of depth uh, when we address any kind of topic in our minds. It is useful to sit down and spend time with the 5,000 word piece to understand that almost every issue in the world is not only complex and many sided, but is also sort of populated by real human beings who uh, are flawed just like you and I are and who are trying to do their best in many circumstances. Um, and, and so I think that level of complexity has only become more necessary uh, in the 21st century rather than less. Uh, so that is one value of it. But the second value I think is also to kind of, uh, and it's related, is to show how various spheres of human activity always connect to each other in sometimes invisible or surprising ways. Um, so there are always sort of if you're writing about art, there is always a political dimension to art. If you're writing about politics, there's always an economic dimension to politics. If you're writing about um, the aviation industry, there is always a social. So there are there are these various spheres, and to trace the connections between each of them uh, both illustrates for me as a writer, and then hopefully you as a reader, uh, how no one issue is simple in itself. And um, things are so enormously complicated and interconnected that it needs a great deal of thought and analysis to be able to address some of the, the problems that face our world today. Um, I, I, my own sort of personal, today, my own personal pick of favorite uh, habit with some of these long form pieces to the point that my editors sometimes get very impatient with me for indulging it is to always go back in history sort of as much as possible, to go back about 50 years or 100 years even sometimes to see where things all began. And obviously um, you can't do this kind of historical regression for every piece that you write, but you can do it for a number of them and they turn out to be enormously rewarding when you can see some of the historical lines of cause and effect that snake forward from the 1950s or the 1850s into the 21st century. And it's it, encourages us to look at some of the histories of these movements and patterns uh, to understand them. Now, it is, uh, you know, again, as you will all know, it is not everyone who has the time or the space or the patience to read 5,000 words. Uh, and sometimes it can feel like uh, you are writing a piece that takes, you know, three months or six months to research and publish only for it to be forgotten over the course of a day or two days after it's had its little moment in uh, the sun on Twitter or wherever else it may be. Uh, and so at some point I started trying to think about, and I'm trying to segue here into Shireen's request that I talk about Substack and newsletters. I try, I, you know, during the pandemic, I started to think about uh, how a writer or a journalist or an editor, anybody in this business can understand what um, uh, what readers like, what readers look for, uh, and and it not and not necessarily as a two way process where I solicit their comments and their feedback on everything that I write and hope that I get you know hundreds of emails. Not in that particular way, but to kind of try to experiment for myself in a in a form that only that only I am responsible for, which is the newsletter. Uh, you know, I can write it on my own time. I can use my own tone of voice. I can um, write about whatever I want, or I can kind of give outtakes from the journalism that I do and, you know, play a little bit with it here and there to, uh, to send it out to readers and to kind of see what they, what the general sort of perception of one kind of writing versus the other kind of writing is. Uh, now, a lot of you may think that this sounds like what is called a busman's holiday, where, you know, I write all day during my own, you know, my professional hours. And at the end of the day, once a month or so, I kind of sit down and write more of my, myself. And it is true that it's sometimes difficult to motivate yourself to write a little bit more after having written all day. But um, I think hopefully, and admittedly also, I've gotten a little lackadaisical about doing it sometimes, especially when you know, a full-time job or an assignment kind of improves. But uh, I think the flip side of that is this ability to, first of all, write for myself in a way that I don't think I have done um, for years, because you're always writing for an editor or for an audience. And so this is, these, this is my own time, so to speak, which is fun sometimes. Um, and then the second thing also, I think, was eventually to try to see whether there was um, a way to make the newsletter format itself nimble in some way. And I haven't come to a conclusion about this, uh, 
I have I know other writers have you know uh, the short story writer novelist and short story writer George Saunders I think runs creative small creative writing lessons on Substack I think Salman Rushdie is publishing parts of his novel or you know serializing his novel in some way on Substack um people write opinion pieces on climate change or on a whole host of other things uh, so there's a lot there's a lot that you can do if you are uh, your own kind of editor and writer and you think you have a good sense of what your readership wants from you um now i haven't as i said i haven't cracked that and i would be eager and grateful to know from all of you what you would like to read in my substacks but um but it taught me of you know th- there's a couple of friends of mine who are also like me full time writers and they have this habit that i have envied and have never been able to replicate for myself which is they carry these notebooks around and every day uh they will try to write one sentence it's one descriptive sentence about something around them something in their day um that they want to describe just to just for the pleasure of putting a sentence together that satisfies and i don't do that i haven't had the patience or the commitment to do that much as i would have loved to um but sometimes i think maybe the substack can be or even is already a version of that a monthly version of that where i try to write these sentences um you know i i inevitably rush through them substacks are still a thousand word post um each one is a thousand word post and so there's only so much you can so much love and care you can lavish on something that you're doing at the end of a day uh but sometimes i think that these are sort of my ways of putting together sentences that i want to write for myself and uh, thinking about subjects that i want to write for myself a small example um i had gone to uh, an exhibition of japanese woodcut prints uh, a few months ago and was hugely taken with them i had seen the genre before and i had always sort of dismissed it as something that was uh cartoonish uh and you know sort of unsubtle because the colors were always bright and bold and the the lines were strong and there was nothing sort of ambiguous or in, at least to me back then interesting about their the ways in which they depicted the world they they, they were they always seemed to me to be sort of um quite uh literal translations of the world to to print uh to woodblock print but on this occasion for some reason i felt deeply in love with it deeply in love with one particular artist um called hiroshi ge and so i went out and i bought some books of his and i tried you know i bought some prints and i was reading i read online about him all the time it was just this little obsession that i had which continues in some way to fester away even now but back then it was a full blown kind of uh, obsession and uh, and so this suddenly the substack became a way in which i could indulge myself kind of organize some of the thoughts that i'd had about his work and uh, and explain to myself almost and then secondarily to the reader why i found it so interesting suddenly and what moved me about some of these prints um and i think maybe to maybe the first step in this kind of newsletter business is always to write for yourself first before you then decide what you can open it up uh into being um so i that sort of I can that that's sort of my half an hour spiel that uh, Arul had asked me to prepare but I'd be delighted to take questions and to move this forward on a Q&A kind of basis thanks Shri thank you so much for that someone uh so I have a couple of questions and sure. um you were talking about how um the what you wanted to do is write sentences and me indulging in your work was mostly just I was so fascinated with how you were able to put out these gripping sentences and i want to ask you where do these sentences come from when you are writing um it's an interesting question i mean the sentence is uh is a beautiful thing it is sort of the basic unit of writing which sounds very um sounds like a very obvious thing to say but i think actually different people have different basic units some people i know writers i've spoken to kind of think of the paragraph as the essential unit of writing um and some people think of phrases so they will they you know will try to kind of think about sentences in which at least one phrase kind of attracts them and the rest of it kind of works around that one phrase um but i mean the sentence is simultaneously beautiful and mysterious i would encourage people to read uh the book suppose a sentence by brian dillon which is really sort of a beautiful excavation of 
I think 19 or 20 sentences and why they work the way they do and um, where their beauty lies. Um, and, and so, but because of this inherent beauty and mystery, it's sort of difficult for me also to explain to you why, uh, you know, where they come from. But I will, I will try to say that, you know, at the beginning of every sentence, I try to think about two things. One is, what is its relationship to the sentence just before and the se sentence that is to come? You know, and I don't mean relationship in terms of language, because that will come afterwards anyway, but relationship in terms of ideas. So each sentence has to, while looking beautiful, also has to convey some small part of a bigger idea, some standalone idea, and that has to flow quite naturally from the previous one and flow naturally into the next one. And so you're always thinking of a sen these sentences as, um, as, 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 you, as beads on a chain, and you kind of have to always remember the string that connects the beads. Uh, terribly abstract, I know, and I, I wish I had sort of a better way to put it, but I, will say, but I will say this. I mean, I think like to think about the purpose of each sentence is always useful. What is this sentence setting out to do? Um, and so that is its, uh, you know, its fun, its sort of kind of, kind of utilitarian uh, function. And then afterwards will come its kind of um, aesthetic function. Should it be long? Should it be short? That depends on the sentences that came before or afterwards. Um, but, uh, should it should it be uh, should it have dependent clauses or not? That also depends on what you have. You already used too many dependent clauses. Is it better just have a simple sentence? Um, uh, what kind of punctuation breaks it up? Is it the comma or the m dash or the semicolon? Or com, you know, all of these things also depends on what has already happened. Um, what is the kind of emotional rhythm that you want to convey to um, uh, to a reader at, at this particular point of time? And that also kind of you have to. So I mean, uh, while you ask your second question, what I will do is actually go back to maybe a Guardian piece and paste something. Uh, which I can kind of explain some of this stuff to you. That sounds perfect. So, um, if there are any questions from the audience, you could either leave them in the chat box or raise your hand and unmute and ask your question. But while we wait for more questions, I have more questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so you were saying that um, while you start your piece, um, it's you focus on the people, you focus on the scene. The mm -hmm. audience is kind of the nucleus of your entire piece, right? So in mm -hmm some way is the long form just a personal not a personal essay just an essay in a sense it kind of is and it kind of isn't um it is not an essay in the sense that you are essentially still trying to uh fulfill a journalistic function there is some part of the world that is not quite clear to readers or maybe is uh, has remained invisible you know some of those things and you are attempting to go out there to unpack it uh, and to explain it as clearly as possible to the reader. So that function is still very generous. Where it does become, as you say, personal, uh, is where the journalist's subjectivity comes into it. Um, now, there's an old, old and uh, defunct school of thought that says journalists should be objective. Uh, there is no such thing. There are no objective human beings. There will be no objective journalists. So what you should do is a try to be fair always, but b also try to of, you know, make your subjectivity as transparent as possible in the piece so that your reader knows how much to discount it, what to discount. But then secondarily, also use that subjectivity towards an aesthetic kind of end. The things that you find um, interesting, you try to gravitate towards. That is a subjective thing after all. You know, I will find some things interesting, you will find different things interesting. But you try to import those things into your piece to, um, to bring them to life. And so in that sense, it is a very personal essay. I mean, what I start a piece with would be very different from what you would start a piece with because we are different people. But uh, the best thing we can do with that subjectivity is to try to um, to enliven the piece with it and to kind of wear it on its sleeve, so to speak. Thank you, sir. There's a question from uh, Vijayta, ma'am. She says, I love your <clears throat> Anamika piece. I remember she brought it to our class as well. Uh, the one about the woman who quits her job to sit and read at Anna's um, sanitary, uh, sanitary library. I take it to class all the time, although not long form. Could you please tell us how that piece came together and whether Anamika is still doing that? Is she now a published uh, writer? We already know. Uh, 
<laughs> okay. Uh, to the second, I actually don't know. Uh, this was somebody who I knew vaguely well, uh, but we have since fallen out of touch because it's you know we have moved countries and pandemic and so on and so forth. But it was essentially, I mean, it was somebody I knew quite well back in the day, and so she would tell me about this habit of hers and what she was doing. She told me that you know she her parents didn't know she had quit all of this stuff and. At some point, I think I was writing, I was asked to write a piece about either a library or a bookshop and the life around it. And I thought of Anamika uh, and her, her her life. So essentially, I didn't kind of find it. I, mean, I already knew her uh, quite well at the time. And I, I had to kind of um, only accompany her to the library multiple times to get a sense of the life she was living, the double life she was living. And so uh, that is essentially her peace came about. Right. There's another question, uh, I think a comment more or less. Is um, your podcast, The Intersection, making a comeback? Uh, no, alas, that it is not making a comeback. It is uh, dead and gone, unfortunately. Uh, it, it, it lived a good life, but I think at some point it became unsustainable to do it uh, as a regular feature. The producer who was paying us to do it very kindly out of his own pocket also had to at some point figure out a way to um, make uh you know make a living and so it is a way um all right so i have actually found a piece which i think might be interesting or a passage which might be interesting to talk to uh, talk through um and i'm going to paste it on chat and you can all kind of here you go so this is from it's from the airline piece and so this is a paragraph right and this is it, this essentially describes a flight that some air lingus uh crew took at some point during the pandemic uh, to China to kind of um, collect masks and uh, and so on to fly back to Ireland at the time. And so this was a, uh, this was from the masks piece. And I, 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 so first of all, I should say I was not with them, obviously, uh, on this flight. In fact, I have never met some of the crew or the, I've never personally met them. All of this was again on Zoom. But you will notice that I still kind of start with what you might call a scene descriptor, which is they landed in Beijing very early on a Sunday morning. Now, um, to the reader, it doesn't strictly matter whether it's a Sunday or a Saturday, but psychologically it does. I tell them that they land in an airport on a Sunday morning uh, and they have a sense of place and time in their minds that they can kind of start working with to populate their own scene in their head, right? Because so much of this, so much of this depends on the reader's imagination, on how they fill in the gaps that I'm unable to provide quite. Often. So I'll see, you know, through the, uh, then I then I go to uh, essentially a long sentence, essentially two, two sentences joined by a semicolon. Now that sentence came about because I knew the first sentence was quite, um, quite short, right? But secondly, also I wanted to kind of convey to the reader what will happen you know, the kind of immensity of the scene that a pilot would notice when he lands the plane and opens the door. This is in China. This is in a, 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 uh, it's in an airport in the middle of the pandemic. They're there on a weird mission. And so obviously you open the door and there's like a huge sensory kind of burst. You see and hear a bunch of things at once. And so that's why I have a, actually two, a, one long sentence, which is basically two sentences joined together by this semicolon to convey to you also very quickly notice the airport notice the you know what it used to be like earlier the buzzing of the you know like a beehive but now it's in hibernation and then what he saw over the six hours or so so like a lot of sensory stuff that comes to you quite quickly and then you go back to um their own situation and their weird the weirdness of kind of getting into this entire mission during the pandemic in the first place that you kind of you uh, you sit in an aircraft, you never leave, very unusual for an aircraft, an airplane crew. Uh, you have to stay behind these uh, big thick plastic curtains while people load the cargo hold and so on with masks and gowns and things like that. So again, this is a relatively, so again, you'll see a rhythm, relatively short sentence, very long sentence. Uh, that kind of, it, it, I don't know, for some reason, I think these short, long, short, long, or, you know, that kind of rhythm works quite well. If you want a reader to process multiple long sentences in sequence, in my sort of estimation, the mind gets tired. So as a writer, you want to kind of always keep the mind quite refreshed. The other reason to kind of keep, the other way to refresh a reader's mind is 
to not overwhelm them with too much detail, but to slide sometimes into a simile or a metaphor or something like that. So for example, you will see there's a lot of detail over here, right? Thick, they have to stay in business class, thick plastic drapes. Where are the masks going? This part of the plane, this part of the plane. What are the masks in these big green bags? Now, so you've given them all this detail and then you introduce a small twist of simile, which is they look, it looked as if the cabin had been booked out by gigantic pods of peace. So that also, again, there's like, a, there's a sort of mental relief that you communicate to the reader at that point saying, you can stop picturing for a minute because I'm going to tell you exactly what it looks like. So don't keep like accumulating these details in your heads. Then all of this has happened. Uh, you know, a journalist's uh, stock in trade is a quote. And why is, you know, because you always want uh, as, as a long form writer, you don't want just your piece, your voice in the piece. You want a multiplicity of voices. You want for, again, for mental relief, somebody else to speak on their own behalf so that you don't have to say anything more. So there's a quote from O'Sullivan, who was one of the pilots. Um, and it, it's not about, uh, he's, you know, obviously he told me all of these uh, details, so the plastic curtains, green bags, all of that stuff. But you pick the quote for its uniqueness, something that he says in a kind of voice that only he has at that point, something that I can't say in that same voice. So I like the fact that he said, you know, there were plenty of smiles and thank yous and nodding heads. It kind of, um, it, it's a nice little description of the fact that these two crews probably couldn't talk to each other. They probably had no language in common, but they're just kind of like nodding at each other across the plastic drapes as they're bringing these masks in. Great quote. He was like a really guy, really good guy to talk. And then, you know, there's another sort of kind of a summary sentence, which slightly um, close, provides some sort of closure to this, this particular paragraph about Aer Lingus and its uh, flights to China to get masks. Now, this is how, now I've explained all this to you and I probably would not have spent this much time thinking consciously about how these sentences work. But at some point you start to internalize um, this idea that each sentence should have uh, a purpose and that each sentence should have an aesthetic function that relates to the sentences before and after. And once you start internalizing that, then it starts coming a little more natural. I guess. Shireen, does that make any sense? Have I just confused? It, it makes perfect sense. So, um, there are um, a lot of questions. Um, Varun seems to have raised his hand. Varun, if you can <laughs> unmute and ask your question. Okay. While we wait for um, Varun to um, unmute. Um, Shifali Ma'am says, I'm completely fascinate, fascinated by everything you have said. Thank you so much for this. I usually feel like I'm not enough to tell the stories I want to tell. Like the words are wrong and I am wrong. I love to write, but it terrifies me as much as it comforts me. So my question is, uh, I suppose, um, is how do you find the courage to write when everything within you tells you that it won't be enough? Um. Part of it is not courage. Part of it is that I have to pay rent on my apartment at the end of every month. And so I have to write these things. But um, in a way that, you know, I'm being facetious, but that is actually a useful thing to think about, which is that at some point, these pieces have to go up. And um, and in our minds, because you, you, Shefali, are closest to your material, I am closest to my material, whatever we write will never be enough. It will never, this is the inherent tragic, the inherent tragedy of all writing which is that it will never be as rich and varied and comprehensive as the pictures we have in our minds. And the whole art act of writing is in itself an insufficient way to put onto paper what we have in our heads. Um, so once we accept that tragedy of writing, the basic tragedy of writing, it kind of liberates us to say, well, um, you know, we know these pictures in our head, these stories in our heads better than anyone else. Nobody else will ever read what we write and think, ah, that doesn't match up to what she had in her head. Only we know. Every, for everybody else, this is a completely new introduction to a completely unfamiliar story. And that also should be liberating. It should feel sort of freeing because you are the one person who is best placed to write this. Um, and then finally, to kind of live with imperfection in a way, which is uh, you know, difficult to start with. But I think if you set yourself artificial kind of uh, deadlines, all deadlines are artificial, I guess, but if you set yourself a particular kind of window and say at the end of this day, week, month, year, I will have finished this piece of writing and that is it. I will not go back to it after that. Um, the more and more you do of that, the more you find that it does get uh, 
to a stage where that you are quite happy. With. And of course, there's a secondary and tertiary stage where you send it to editors and so on. Um, and they weigh in on what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and that always improves your piece. So don't be, don't uh, be bashful about showing these pieces to uh, those people you trust, uh, whose judgment you trust. Thank you, sir. Um, so Vijayata ma'am again has a question. She says, when I'm teaching long form um, writing to a class, students often tell me that they find it hard to sustain the same voice throughout the piece. They're exhausted by their own voices. What would you suggest they do when something like this happens? My instinct here is to say that if it's difficult to sustain a voice over a long piece, then maybe it's not your voice. Um, maybe you need to find a voice that comes relatively naturally. And so you don't have to exert yourself to sustain it over 5,000 words. Now, as I said, my instinct is to say that, but I don't you know, this have to kind of look at this on a case by case basis. Um, it, it does some, what exhausts me, let me tell you what exhausts me, which uh, is that actually speaking a long form piece, um, you know, we all have our own voices, but a long piece also operates in different registers, voice registers. So there are, you know, so in my, in the, in the masks piece, for example, there are some parts of the piece where I operate in the register that I think I work best at, which is when I'm describing a scene. In my mind, at least in my own judgment, that is what I can do both best and easiest. What I struggle to do quite often is to do the kind of um, short, quick summaries of economic history or theory, you know, the kind of background context that I find very dry when I'm reading it in other people's pieces. And so therefore, uh, I have to really grit my teeth and do it. And I don't think I do it very well at all. Um, that kind of stuff feels very difficult for me to, and I struggle over there. So, but, I'm, and both of these have to operate in different voices where I write the small nuggets of history or explanation or whether it's science or economics or whatever it is, I have to really try to compress a lot of information into uh, a few sentences and make them accessible to readers who don't have a background in that and at the same time, um, make them read in interesting ways so that people's attention don't flag. And that, requires a very different kind of voice to when I'm describing a scene. And so I would suggest that maybe within a long piece, um, you try to think about the different registers in which your voice works, and then maybe you won't feel an exhaustion with the sameness throughout the piece. Maybe you will see, to, see for yourself that there are uh, different ways of doing different things. And yet there is a sort of a larger holistic way of melding all those voices together into one, one big uh, kind of voice, I guess. Um, so for example, if your voice is naturally to be quite, you know, wisecracking, uh, slightly jokey, that kind of thing, then there is a way to do even th that, there's a way to do even the boring context stuff with that kind of slightly jokey voice and tone. So you can seed that voice throughout the piece, but pay more attention to how the registers operate uh, differently depending on the material. That you use. Um, if you could tell us uh, how to contain yourself while writing a long form, because most of the time when we research uh, into long forms, the answers we get are so vast and it's so hard to contain yourself uh, to a certain scene, to a certain story, what to filter out, what to tell, what to retell. And could you tell us also a bit of your editing process, the carpentry, carpentry you go through while you're like putting together a piece? Uh, my carpentry is the complete antithesis of what people teach. And so I should probably not say this, but you know, I mean, the old, um, the, the, the standard philosophy is that you write and then you rewrite, you kind of draft and redraft, so on and so forth. The first draft is always rough, that kind of thing. Uh, because of some mental tick of my own, I find I I find it very difficult to move on from one sentence to the next until I think that first sentence is as close to a finished product as I can as, as I can think of at that point. And so I write very slowly as a result. Um, and it's probably not the best way to write. I think it's quite inefficient and because it, uh, everything does end up being edited in any case. Um, but 
it just sort of seems to work for me and gives me mental peace of mind when I'm writing. So that's good enough, I guess. Um, but uh, sorry, you said the other thing was how to restrain yourself. Um, you know, again, I would try to, well, there's a couple of, so broadly, I think we go back to this idea that everything that goes into your piece um, has to have its own purpose. And if you can kind of try to think about the elements of a piece through their um, through their purpose, then you find that you will actually be able to streamline your writing a lot. So obviously, like everyone else, I also do a structure. Uh, and the structure starts very broadly. I kind of think of five or six sections or four sections, whatever it may be. And I kind of think of what each section is setting out to achieve. Um, and then say, within each section, I then start to structure it almost paragraph by paragraph. And I try to think of what each paragraph is setting out to achieve. And at that point, then I can start writing. And when I start writing, I uh, keep thinking again about what each sentence is setting out to achieve. What is the next sentence? Uh, what is its use in life? Why is it going to come into being? And if you do it that way, you will see that it eliminates a lot of um, uh, uh, kind of redundancy in your piece. And your piece. so if you want, for example, say you want, uh, say I, for this, okay, let's go back to the mask story. I talked to three airlines about you know, um, relief flights that they flew to China to bring um, protective material back to their respective countries. I talked to KLM, I talked to Aer Lingus, I talked to one. Um, but all three essentially have the same purpose, which is to kind of illustrate to the reader that there was a world in which this was happening. And these are the ways in which it happened. You know? So I don't have to present all three examples. I need really one really good example, like a kind of an example in which the details are vivid, and in which the person talking kind of has a unique voice of his or her own. And, um, and, and it kind of illustrates all the points I want to make about how these relief flights were run, that kind of stuff. So then you look at the material that you have and you judge which one is best. Sometimes you all of them are good and you just pick one. It's, it's, some, it's quite random sometimes. In this case, I picked Aer Lingus because I'd spent so long talking about KLM and the rest of the piece. Sometimes it's as random a reason as that. Um, but now you have successfully kind of streamlined your material from this much to this much, and you have identified why this material is in peace, the purpose of it. And then you can kind of start to craft and, you know, uh, to write it in the tightest possible way. And I think that way you, uh, you give yourself the chance also of being both economical in your prose, but also where you want to be, you can be a little lavish or um, uh, or, or self-indulgent with language because it frees up some of the space and resources that you're using uh, in other ways. So. Yes, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, Varun has a question. He said he would like you to elaborate on how you see a platform like Substack panning out in an age where quote-unquote democratic governments are cracking down on anti-establishment journalists. Yeah, I think actually, I don't know, it's a good question. And it's the latter. I think it actually does leave journalists more exposed um, in many ways, not just because uh, somebody could shut your substack down tomorrow, but also because, you know, uh, there is an inherent value to journalism being done as an institution. There are so many resources that I avail of because I have an editor and a fact checker and a photo editor and, you know, people to read the piece and give me feedback and people to give me photo, uh, story ideas. Um, there's a huge value to this. And I think the institutional, that institutional value is lacking in Substack. And I think, of course, Substack is, <clears throat> what is it essentially? It's a symptom of an age in which um, people don't want to pay for news. And so news papers and magazines and news websites are kind of having to lay off journalists. And yet journalists can only do one thing. They really only know how to do journalism. So they have to start these substacks and hope that people will eventually pay for them. It's essentially the, the capital capitalist model as applied to journalism and a great example of why uh, the capitalist model has uh, exposed or, or, or sort of uh, driven the nails into the coffin of journalism. So, to speak. Um, so, so there are multiple vulnerabilities here. It's the vulnerability of not having an institution to back you. It's a vulnerability of not having an institution to make you do better work. And it's the vulnerability of not having an institution to pay you for doing this kind of work. I think it's like all three. So I think 
you know, I mean, I look, I started Substack because I it was a self, it's like an indulgence for me. Um, but there are a lot of people who view it as a livelihood. And that's, I think, both a sad and dangerous uh, turn of events. Thank you, sir. So Tabitha has a question. She says, with all its layers and intricacies, how do you know where to start a long form piece? And how do you know what information to filter out? Um, it, again, this is also a great place where subjectivity and personality comes into play. I mean, everybody starts a long form piece in a different way. Um, sometimes, uh, of course, the subject will suggest itself to you. Um, but for me, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, my tendency or proclivity is always towards scenes, towards things I can describe, visual kind of um, situations in which I can immerse the reader right away. I want always to give the reader a sense that they've been dropped into the deep end of the subject and they're, this is a whole new world around them and they have to, you know, but they can trust me. I am your guide and for the next 5,000 words, I will show you what these scenes mean. And who these people are. So that is my tendency. So you will see most of my pieces start with something visual, um, either a place or a person. Uh, even if somebody is telling me stories about a place, you know, I will kind of use that narration to build a scene for myself. So, for example, again in the this airlines piece that I wrote about airlines being airplanes being grounded during the pandemic, the opening scene is this boneyard, this place where planes go to uh, when there's in suspended animation, so to speak. Now, I didn't get a chance to go to the boneyard, but I knew when I was talking to both aviation executives as well as the person who ran the boneyard, I knew that what I wanted from them more than anything else was a visual sense of what it's like to be there. So I, I would ask them saying, can you describe it to me? And they'll say, well, we can send you photos. And I say, yeah, yeah, send me photos. That's fine. But I want your impression of what it looks like, what it looks like to a human being, not to a camera. And then they will kind of give me their impressions of it. And sometimes those, those end up being so much more vivid because the human mind remembers different things and processes it differently. And then out of this, I built a composite visual image of what this boneyard looks like. And I, my operating theory here was that this is an exotic and interesting enough place that the reader is immediately swept along in the narrative. But, uh, but even that has to have a purpose. You can't kind of indulge... Um, the sense of the visual for too long before getting to what you call uh, you know, the, the nub of the story. And there has to be a seamless transition from the scene to the, uh, to the argument or scene to the idea. Uh, or sometimes as in the case of, um, you, you know, I teach a workshop uh, once every quarter for the Guardian. And in that I give, I show people an example of how the three layers that I pointed out earlier, how they are actually, you know, you don't put them programmatically as, you know, top layer, section one, uh, middle layer, section two, return to section one. You know, it's not programmatic like that. Literally, there are, uh, you know, I color coded one of my pieces uh, by layer. And then I kind of showed the people in the workshop sort of how sometimes within space of a single paragraph, all three layers will coexist. And it's difficult to see that when you're reading it without the color coding. But that is how um, deeply intertwined these things are. So even when you are doing a visual scene at the top, you need to kind of always be seeding these deeper ideas into that visual scene and kind of signaling the things that are to come. You know, you're telling the reader, this is what you're seeing. And even while I'm describing it to you, I'm also telling you what we're going to be talking about for the next 5,000 words. You know, 5,000 words is a long time. Somebody will get bored at the end of paragraph one and leave you and that's the end of it. So you have to keep them um, keep them interested with the promise of big things to come from the very beginning. Thank you, sir. Um, there was a question about asking you uh, to describe your writing process. Or I think a better way to put it is, could you tell us how you crafted your journalism over the years? Is this Lonav's question? Is that the one you're looking at? or earlier? No, it's not Lonav's question. Oh, okay, okay. Um, Okay, well, the, the, when you say writing process, what do you mean? So, because at least with me, there's two different things. There's a long period of research and there's a long period of writing. So do you mean the research? Do you mean the writing? The writing, sir. The writing. Um, okay, I mean, well, as I said, I mean, early, it usually starts with me kind of um, sitting and examining the kind of material I've found. If all the notes I've taken from the books I've read, 
my interview notes the photos i've taken the the conversations i've had uh and the purpose of all of this is to kind of do what I, as i said i've already told you you know to come up with my three or four layers and to build a structure section by section uh and then to populate that structure uh in each section with the paragraphs you know what kind of i won't do all of that at the outset i'll do section 1 first say okay in section 1 if this is the purpose of section 1 what are my paragraphs doing here what is the first first paragraph going to do what is the second paragraph going to do? and um this is all you know very often literally there's a pad next to me at all points and this is all put down in a pad uh, uh in its pages and then so once i have that it gives me a framework uh on which i can hang my story and the structure is um indispensable i used to i used to be the kind of fool who never structured his pieces um thinking i could hold it all in my head at the same time and kind of do it and somehow i muddled around for a long while and then at some point i started structuring and it really is has transformed the process because again it is the more you structure i mean all of this seems very uh mechanical because we all think of tend to think of writing as a spontaneous outpouring of prose and ideas uh but my point here is that more you get the mechanical stuff out of the way the more you can actually allow for spontaneity when you sit down to write the you don't have to worry about what this section has to do or like what what will the next section do or what is this paragraph you've already charted all so now you can think about the words and the sentences and the 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 fun stuff the the metaphors and the similes and that um and um you know and and as lord of did ask you know there is a uh, writers block all the time i mean everybody has it i hate to write um but uh, imposing a deadline on yourself reminding yourself that a first draft is only a first draft um th- th- there is time to kind of edit and revise later uh that what you should really do is just try to get the structure down and try to get some salient points down and more importantly try to get the ideas once you've reminded yourself of that you can then kind of uh try to free yourself a little bit more i think the idea is to not put pressure on yourself for the first draft and to always think of the first draft as something that is quite rough even if like me you think you can't get past a sentence until it sounds quite good at some point you should just move on and so these things that i do for myself i set small targets 500 words a day that's about as much as i can manage but if you can do that it accumulates over the course of a month you've written you know um 10000 words on weekdays and that's a lot and as long as you can keep doing that day after day it gets easy I promise it gets easy so if i could ask you about how you structure your narrative because it's something that seems to go so easily with um the reader with me who is reading it or anybody else so just in terms of the narrative or the syntax or whatever how do you know which part goes where and how do you sort of assemble it in that way um i mean the narrative is the structure definitely i think uh and it is it lies in the structure in the sense that you need to always kind of figure out well what here's something that is useful to me. it's a, it's a weird trick but i will kind of uh, tell you what i so very often i think about what will happen if i went to meet a friend at a bar and he asked me very casually what have you been working on like i tell him you know i i was in nigeria recently and he will ask well what what took you to nigeria what's the, what's the story and so then i start to think about what are the, what is the first thing i will tell him to try to make sure that he is interested in the rest of the story that i have told um or to make sure he will ask more questions so for example in this particular case i will say what did you know there were jews in nigeria i mean until now everybody thought there were only christians and muslims for the most part but there's this new surprising community of jews and then hopefully he's intrigued enough to say what do you mean how can there be a new community of jews and then you start to explain a little bit now the minute you've um got this conversational mode switched on in your mind you start to f- filter things that are more important and less important in terms of how high in the narrative they should come um so what is sort of the most surprising thing or the most important thing to hook somebody to make them want to read more and then what is the next thing they need to know to understand why this is surprising or important and the next thing and the next thing so very often it is really a question of following it one step at a time building a narrative from this methodical exploration of the elements of a story and uh, and and i i promise you sometimes this really does work if you try to narrate your story back to yourself to kind of pretend you are somebody who never heard this before and try to think about what 
you would need to know to understand how important and amazing the story is. And so, and of course, and there, there is a flip side. Sometimes once you have carried out this exercise, you may think perhaps it is not as important and amazing as I thought. And stories do die on the page. Uh, and so you have to kind of either figure out other ways to make them live or alternately just abandon them and try to find something else um, at the same time. So this is all, uh, you know, it's, it's a stories live and are conceived very broadly, I think, as they should be. But I, when, the minute you finished your reporting and the research, when you sit down, then it becomes something that is quite micro. And it becomes something that proceeds in a very kind of step-by-step -step way in which each step is connected to the previous one. And so you can kind of follow these through to a, to a logical conclusion. Thank you so much for that. So thank you so much for all your responses. Thank you for engaging with us and taking time off whatever you're doing. Um, Thanks Jetama, for having me. Thank you so much for being here, sir. We look forward to you coming back for Blue Pencil or Meta. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry to give you the thanks. Sorry. Last time we had Samant in college, he was close at hand and I had the singular pleasure of uh, inflicting upon him a rather furious flower garland, as they are called in our parts. You will see that uh, stung by the experience, he has chosen to put a continent or two between us. He's now safely far away uh, and uh, safe from my administrations but he will still have to endure a vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Samat, for joining us at short notice and uh, doing such a cracker job of uh, opening up long form and talking about it as uh, a kind of schooling in information culture, in, uh, the, in looking at the invisible scaffolding that holds up the things that we think we know about. Right? Uh, if we had more time, I would have sort of flung one question at you and said, isn't this a lot like uh, uh, the other thing that connects us, which is quizzing, but uh, there's a, that's perhaps a conversation for another time and place, right? Thank you very much. And I hope we can have you join us again very soon, perhaps in Bangalore when you're here. Always, always. Thank you so much for having me and putting up with my rambling. Thanks. Thanks a lot.